Hey everyone, thanks for the opportunity to speak to, to all of you about revision ankle replacements. This is kind of a, a newer topic since a lot of ankle replacements are being done globally. Here are my disclosures, none of which are really relevant to the talk today. Now, when we look at the population globally, it's an increasing and aging population that really wants to continue to stay active. In the US, pickleball has become a big sport, the fastest growing sport. And here's a picture of individuals doing pickleball. And you'll see they are older individuals using a tennis court that's been shortened up. These patients want active lifestyles and they want to keep motion. Ankle arthritis can affect their quality of life. And some studies have shown it is worse than end stage renal disease and worse than uh, your, your hip arthritis. There has been remarkable success rate at five years and 10 years with ankle replacements, upwards of 90% success rate at those timelines. But revisions are increasing in numbers because more and more of these patients are requiring something done down the line. Now, when we look at total ankle replacement back in the 1970s, that left-hand x-ray shows you the earliest ankle replacements. We have evolved over time as we continue to increase our understanding of these replacements. To the right-hand side is kind of the newest things that we see nowadays. These are joint sparing replacements that give a lot of bone stock, that keep a lot of bone stock, and respect the anatomy and the biomechanics to try to replicate normal human anatomy. But like I said, the journey of a patient with total ankle replacement can lead to revisions or failures down the line. 85 to 90% of patients who have an ankle replacement have at least a decade of mobility and comfort and pain relief, but problems can happen. And what are those problems? Here's a patient that I had performed and in under a year has aseptic loosening that's causing pain, dysfunction, and swelling. Infection is a known risk for any joint replacement. And in this patient, there is a visual uh, confirmation of something infected. And then this is an ankle replacement that is going on to fail due to infection. Patients can have component malalignment and instability. Here is a patient that under a year from the surgery got referred to me, and you can see this entire total ankle is now misaligned and valgus, but there's also an associated medial malleolar stress fracture that evolved into a full fracture. Here's a patient who had polyethylene wear and osteomyelitis referred to me, but the wear and the, osteo, uh, and the osteolysis was so bad that the implant became unstable. The patient ended up with a medial malleolar cyst that was so big, led to a stress fracture, and multiple surgeons have tried different attempts to try to save the ankle replacement while trying to deal with these cysts from osteolysis. Eventually, this patient ended up with surgery with me for a salvage procedure. Here's a patient in an area that is highly unrecognized or not talked about globally, from my opinion. And it's the allergy aspect of patients who have what looks to be a great replacement, hip, knee, shoulder, ankle, and has continued pain with unexplainable reasons. And this is a patient that I had done surgery on and for two years has continued to have pain and problems with this ankle replacement, has had a full workup you got to think about metal allergies. These are real. They cause pain in a setting, especially where it's unexplained by any other test, whether it's aseptic loosening or infection or some of the other things I talked about. And finally, patients can have avascular necrosis or uh, tailor subsidence of their components. And here's a patient where I had done a in-bone total ankle replacement. And over time, that talus has died and the Taylor component has subsided. And it's another reason why these implants can fail. So addressing these issues and pathologies is really like detective work. You've got to piece together the patient's pain patterns, their alignment, their stability, their limited motion, and try to get a deeper understanding of what may be going on. And that diagnostic studies start with x-rays. A patient like this has x-rays, there's a suspicion for impingement of the fibula on the talus and the lateral implant. Now you gotta correlate that with the physical exam. You wanna get a weight-bearing CT. I know this is not globally readily available, but it is a very important component uh, in the algorithm of care for diagnosis of these total ankle patients that have continued pain. So here's a patient who had a weight-bearing CT scan, and you can see there is impingement both laterally and medially on this weight-bearing CT where you can see what is happening when the patient is loading these components and the joint. 
Um, getting an MRI can be important. Now, I understand that there'll be a lot of scatter from the MRI, but you can do a metal suppressed MRI and you can look for things like avascular necrosis. This is what AVN looks like in a non-implant patient, but know that you can do these kind of images also uh, with and without contrast to look for AVN in patients who have uh, a subsidence of the talus. Obviously, you're going to look at soft tissue issues as well. Spec, T, spec CT, I think, has been a very important part of our uh, painful uh, total ankle uh, diagnostic protocol. And we're looking for where there's increased activity. Here's a patient with increased activity around his implant. This was an infected implant that we then had to take out. Here's a patient with an indium scan, right? So looking for hot spots uh, where, where the indium is collecting and that yet another way to look for infection. Um, I find that this is not as good as spec CT, but spec CT is not readily available uh, everywhere around the world. And so it is a, a component to have in your armamentarium to diagnose these painful uh, failed total ankles because a misdiagnosis can take these patients down the wrong path. Now, when we talk about infection, one of my colleagues, Jay Parvizi, um, has come up with a nice algorithm, mostly for hip and knee um, um, infection diagnoses, but there are major and minor criteria. Some of it's physical exams, some of it's blood work, but you wanna get things like CRP, D-dimer, ESR, white counts. And basically you get different points for different positive findings. You add the points up, and then depending on the number of points you have, you're infected, inconclusive, or not infected. So that's one of the ways you can try to rule out infection. You can try to aspirate the joint, but I find that that's not always successful getting enough fluid to, to send this off to a lab. And then really the, the gold standard is to take these patients to the operating room, look at the number of white blood cells under high power field, and if that's over five, that's an infected ankle replacement and needs to come out. With regards to allergy testing, what's readily available is the skin testing that is not very reliable, especially for metal allergies. So I like to do a, a, a blood test um, and that looks at the, the activity of the white blood cells and how reactive the patient's white blood cells are to different types of uh, metals that they're exposed to. And this has been shown to be much more uh, specific and sensitive to metal allergies. So remember when we're, there's an art and science to revision total ankles, uh, it's just not a procedure. You really have to understand the depth of what you're dealing with and have a tailored response for the patient. You do need to address bone loss. You have to address infections. You've got to have a strategy of different implants that are available on the market and what would work when. You've got to remove the implant, use bone grafts as needed, do soft tissue work as needed, and really get these patients an aligned implant that works well. And then getting them good rehabilitation is an important part to their outcomes. When we look at outcomes, 10 to 26% of revision total ankles require further surgical intervention. That's much higher than a primary ankle replacement. 14% of these will still fail. The survivorship at four years is about 87%. Not horrible, but not as good as a primary. So here's some cases I wanna go through with you guys, there's three of them. Here's a 76 year old female, had a primary ankle replacement done uh, at an outside facility. That primary ankle replacement continued to have pain less than two years out, had a revision done six months out from surgery, continued to have pain, then it gets referred to me. And you can see that the component is subsiding. And this is very unusual for two ankle replacements to fail in three years. It increases my level of suspicion of a possible uh, um, metal allergy. So we get her tested and she pings for nickel, right? Her infection workup was negative, pings for nickel. We get a custom implant made without nickel. It's all titanium and she can go on to get a subtail fusion with a combination total talus ankle replacement. She's done well about a year out from surgery. Here's a 64 year old male who had a, a, an agility ankle replacement 20 years ago. It is failing comes in to see me and we can do, give them a, another custom option, total talus fusion part under the, under the implant with a subtalar fusion, talonavicular fusion, and a custom implant to be able to get them better alignment, better function, and continue to live with some motion. And last, this is a 72 year old who had a star ankle replacement three years ago. 
And sometimes you get lucky and you can just do a simple ankle revision replacement. I like to do bone sparing options where I can so that if they need more surgery down the line, they can get that done with one of the stemmed implants. So less than one years out, this patient is not having any pain, not having any lateral column pain or medial malvolar pain. If you look at that star ankle replacement, um, if I go backwards, you'll see that there is uh, there was some uh stress on the medial malleolus and that was causing the pain as well. So in general, you got to master the art of revision surgery, understand the mechanisms of failure, continue to keep up with ongoing research and the evolution of implant techniques and surgical methodologies and contribute to that if you can and create a team of surgeons, plastic surgeons, neurosurgeons, physical therapists, vascular surgeons to get these patients optimized as best you can, as you can before, during and after surgery. Thank you.